And my main questions in that is I'll say, I want to write off these clothes I'm buying for this rap video I'm doing around money. They're like, well, you can't really write off clothes. I'm like, I know other rappers can, and I know I'm white and I probably can't rap, but that doesn't mean I couldn't have the same write off. And they're like, well, if you have a production company, you can write off. I'm like, great. We just figured out there's a way to write this off by asking different questions. Cause they think in a box, we have to think outside of that box and then have them find ways to fit that. So uh, everyone, uh, some of you, uh, most of you probably know who Garrett is. Uh, not everyone does. Garrett's a good friend of mine. Um, <clears throat> Garrett Gunderson, he's, he's, in my opinion, the foremost leader when it comes to talking about money and finances, um, particularly for the entrepreneur, which is ultra important, obviously. But then he's, he threw this like really weird, not only is, well, I thought it was weird because it was bold, but it's like curveball into your life that started how long ago, actually? So in 2017, I started doing stand up comedy as a hobby, just to enjoy, because when I was a little kid, I used to tell jokes to my, grandparents and my aunt and uncles, and they thought it was hilarious. And, uh, I, in 2017, I was at a baseball game and made my wife laugh. And she was like, wow, where'd you get these jokes? I'm like, from my own brain, babe. From my <laughs> own brain. And that Sunday, someone, um, I'm pretty, you know, Keith Yaki was hosting an event and I was going to give a 45 minute, uh, financial talk. And he goes, Oh dude, our next speaker is hilarious. He kept saying the word hilarious. And I was oh, like, no, Wait, no pressure. I just got up and told some jokes. People laughed enough that I started doing stand up. And then in 2019, Cat managed most of the greats in comedy, saw me do stand up and said, When are you going to make a career out of this? And I realized like entertainment is the language of the masses and it could be a gateway to transformation, especially on this topic of money, which no comedian talks about money because they don't understand it. So I decided to become the funniest person in money. Right. Like I could be, I'm never going to, I'm not the funniest comedian right now. I, I'm clear about that. But when this talk comes around, I don't think that you're going to find anyone funnier. So, and I think you can laugh and learn and you're supposed to remember three times more when you laugh. So. And, and I love that. And I think, well, you know what, just, just, just to start with, by the way, um, has the tour started or it's about to start? Like we're real close to the tour. Starting. We are next week. I start in Tempe and La Jolla. So, uh, the Tempe improv holds like 450 people. So we're really hustling to, to get that full. And then uh, I'm doing 15 cities this year. And then I'm doing three more next year. And I plan on culminating next year's with my newest set. Right now I'm doing the set called the American Ream, which we've already filmed the comedy special. We had three Emmy winners on the crew. My director was up for an Emmy this year. I think he's got the most comedy specials on Netflix. Did Joe wow. Coy, Daniel Tosh, Steve Martin, and uh, Martin Short, like crazy. Like it's, it's, it's insane that this is where I'm already at and, that, and it's a lot of fun and a uh, little bit of stress, Nick. I mean, you know, trying to, trying to fill 15 cities in the middle of a pandemic. I was like, yeah. Hey, how could I make life complicated? I sold my home. I bought a home. I sold my business. I launched a comedy career. I launched a new company. I'm just trying to like, see what I can, if I can get my entire head gray, I'm, I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing. And, and on that note, uh, you know, uh, so again, like I said, Garrett is probably the smartest person I know when it comes to finances around entrepreneur wealth creation, that sort of thing. Um, and then now the fact that he's integrating the lessons to be learned through comedy, um, Garrett, just right off the bat for those who, I mean, I know, I know Rick is out in, uh, the Redondo beach area. That's, that's kind of close to La Jolla. Um, what's, what's the best site that people can go just to see your tour. And then if, if they're close by and they can make it, uh, they can get a, get a ticket. What's the, what's the best site for that? And Ray, if we could type that in the, in the chat for everyone, that'd be great too. It's Garrett Gunderson, two R's, two T's S O N Garrett Gunderson dot G G Garrett Gunderson dot G G. You'll see all the, uh, all the cities and look, man, I'm just going to say this right out front. If you, because you're part of this group, if you put in the code FF20, that stands for friends and family, 20 bucks, you can get the tickets for 20 bucks, which awesome. is our hard cost of the club. Um, so FF20 at GarrettGunderson.gg. We're also doing a two-day workshop after five of the cities, um, which is we're still integrating entertainment, but we're going to help people really dial in their finances, keep more of what they make without budgeting, plug all those financial leaks so that your money goes further and you can enjoy life a little bit more along the way, reduce risk and have a little bit of fun doing it. Awesome. I love that. And here's, here's, here's a, a little bit of the scope. Uh, and Garrett, here's what I think we could do. I could, I could lay a little bit of lay of the land. Maybe you could talk about some of the high, higher level concepts. And then again, the beautiful thing about this is, uh, as we say in the council, information is good, but access is better. This is your opportunity to ask Garrett specific questions about your specific situation um, and get answers. Because as far as I know, I don't even think Garrett's available for hire. 
um, which means no amount of money can get an hour of his time. But here you get a bit, of, you get a, an hour, you know, just to to to, to work with that. So. Um, Here's here's why I thought this was important. Obviously, this is an entrepreneurial group, and we talk a lot about marketing and that sort of thing. But a couple of fundamental principles that I know true to be for myself and why I think it's important for us to all have this conversation. Fundamental truth number one is your business shouldn't necessarily fund your lifestyle, right? Your business should be the wealth generation mechanism, which then moves into this is old school, rich dad, poor dad stuff, I guess, but goes into investment vehicles and very other smart things that then can fund your retirement and your lifestyle, ideally, right? So us all as business owners, no matter what level of success we're at, like I found it super interesting that I was having conversations with mutual friends of ours, Garrett, and they're just like, I made a little extra you know, money from a launch. Should I put 100% of it into Bitcoin? And I was like, you're you're a smart, intelligent entrepreneur, but to put a hundred percent of one of your earnings into Bitcoin because you heard that that's the bet, like clearly financial intelligence isn't at the top of everybody's rung, even as intelligent, successful entrepreneurs. And so I think it's important for us to understand because as we all know, uh, it's not how much money you make, it's how much you keep that matters. And then what you do with it, that matters. And then I had one other conversation with a dude last week who I, I just announced to, to everybody that we're moving out of Toronto and it's my first move. And, uh, Everyone is 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 uh, uh, assuming that I'm moving out of the country, which I'm not. I'm staying in Canada. I'm just going out to the West Coast. But um, as part of this, somebody sent me a voice message and basically said, Nick, um, I don't blame you for leaving Canada because the 50% income tax here is crazy. And I'm like, first and foremost, I don't know about you, but I don't pay 50% in taxes, <laughs> you know, like, yes, for the corporate worker in Canada, the income tax is like 51% if you make more than 150 grand or whatever. But I certainly don't do that because, you know, we have structures in place and all that. And then it just, it just continued to remind me that no matter what level of entrepreneur we're at, there's people who just don't have the financial intelligence, if you will, um, to be able to think about business as a wealth generation tool to then put into other assets to then fund our lifestyle and our retirement. So Garrett, on a high level, and I know you've written, God, I don't know how many New York Times bestselling books, which is a whole nother conversation, by the way. Um, and people could get your content all over the place. But from a high level, what, what would you like to say to lay some fundamental groundwork? And that could spawn some questions from our people to, to get some answers from you. So I'll start a little philosophical. I'll get really practical um, in this philosophy. So let's make a distinction. You hear the term financial freedom all the time, but I think it's important we define financial freedom. It's when money is no longer your primary reason or excuse for doing or not doing something. So let me break that down to three measures of worth. The first measure of worth is price. That's what we pay. People that are in the consumer condition, take more than you give scarcity mindset, focus on price and price alone. And they try to get things really cheap or avoid spending money and they cut back, but no one shrinks away to wealth. The second measure of worth is cost, which is our overall net economic impact. And so let's say that I get a really good accountant that costs me twice as much, but they save me five times more than the other person. That's a lower cost, but a higher price. And the third measure that I want people to really pay attention to is value. Value is your overall feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment and enjoyment. And most people don't make value-based decisions. They make price-based decisions, and it limits their overall enjoyment of living wealthy along the way. So financial freedom, money is no longer your primary reason or excuse. It's a consideration, not the only consideration. And when you're financially free, you think value first, cost second, and price third. Now, the distinction between financial freedom and financial independence is really critical. Financial independence is when you have enough recurring revenue from assets that create cash flow to cover your basic expenses. What it means is if you don't open a computer, look at your phone, or show up at an office, money still comes in that day. Now, it's not entirely passive. We still have to be stewards. We still have to have the ability to monitor and to make sure to manage so that continues, but it's just that it isn't a relentless pursuit like maybe launching a business or doing a launch and marketing might be. And so when we don't follow the traditional method of saving 10% of our income and try to earn 10% on the 10%, we can act, have absolutely exponential results. When you're economically independent, it means every active dollar you earn can buy more assets and create more cash flow. That's 10 times more advantageous than when you're using some of your income just to save money. Now, economic independence is the game. So how do we get there? There's really five key components to get there. And the mm -hmm. first one 
is to boost your bottom line and plug your financial leaks. I'm going to talk about four main ways to do that. And the first way is to save tax. So when you tip the government, that's money that was rightfully yours, but because you had ignorance tax, because you didn't know what to do, you gave them 50%, like someone said to Nick, right? So what I'd rather see you do is use this framework. And this framework is simple, and it doesn't matter which country you're in, it works. There's three buckets to tax. The first bucket is your team. The second bucket is your deductions. And the third bucket is the game changer. It's called reclassification of income. So team, deductions, and reclassification. So let's look at your team first. The first person everyone has to have on their team that's an entrepreneur is your person that gets you the data. So if you're just starting out, maybe that's a bookkeeper. It could even be part-time. If you're a more substantial business, maybe it's a controller and they're actually handling payroll and they're showing you your numbers. Or if you're even bigger, maybe it's a CFO who's building out pro formas and looking at your overall projections of your finances and looking what you can afford to implement inside of your business. The second person is a tax strategist. Most people don't have tax strategists. They have historians. Historians in the tax game go, hey, great year. Here's what you owe. And unfortunately, there's far too much of that where they're reactive instead of proactive. A tax strategist looks at your deductions and says, how do we maximize these in a way that you keep more of what you make? The third person on your team is an attorney. Now, if you're just starting out, you're less than a million of revenue. That's just a corporate attorney that helps you choose the right corporation. But if you have more than a million of revenue, it's a tax attorney that will bring you more tax advantages than your tax strategist, because that's where the sweet spot is. Now, if you own a commercial building, then you might want a cost segregation engineer that allows you to accelerate the tax advantages inside of a commercial building. If you don't have one, you don't need to worry about the fourth person. The second bucket is deductions. The first thing you do is anytime you spend money, I want you to ask the question, who business? And now I use personal credit cards, never business credit cards for a couple of reasons. Something Nicholas brought right up at the very beginning. He says, you don't just want your business to fund your lifestyle. And unfortunately, a lot of business owners rape and pillage from their business to spend money on everything. I want to treat the business the same way I want my employees to treat the business. I get reimbursed for expenses. And that way, if I ever, you know, like if you have a business card and you accidentally pay for something personally with that, it could pierce your corporate veil, be considered alter ego when it comes to the court system. And it might mean that you don't have the protection, but if you just spend it personally and they get reimbursed, there's two things that happen that way. Number one, I might buy something. I'm like, I don't know if I can really write this up. Me with my accounting team every three months, I'm going to ask them. I'm going to say, hey, can I write this trip to Italy off? And they go, well, not really. Why could you write it off? I'm like, well, I'm going to hold a mastermind one of the days. We're going to go film where my family's from another day. We're going to actually have meetings for our corporate compliance because I think better in Italy than I do in Utah where I live. And so all of a sudden, I'm writing off 45% of that trip because of that conversation. All I got to do is document what I think I can write off. And I do it simply. I print out the credit card statement. I say which company the expense might be related to. If it's one that I know for certain I can write off, we just reimburse it. If I'm not sure, we wait till that 90-day mark, ask the accounting team, and then we reverse, reimburse based upon what the write-off is. So documentation, right? And asking the question if it relates to the business. Now, the third category, reclassification. This is where we can save a boatload of money. Um, if you choose the right corporation, you might be able to get more passive income, which can avoid some taxes on distributions and dividends versus salary. Or if you can turn ordinary income into capital gains, then you can say, well, <clears throat> ordinary income is typically high when I move this to an asset that's appreciated that when I sell it, I'm paying a lower tax rate. Or third, tax-free strategies, which through charitable trusts, through donor advised funds, through something in America called the 1202. There's all these tax advantages that are exclusive to business owners. And the fourth one is tax arbitrage, which is I don't like the notion of buying something to get a tax advantage that I spend a dollar on and I only get 40 cents back. I just lost 60 cents. So my tax arbitrage is I spend a dollar and I get more than a dollar back. Two things I've done with that is I own a bunch of land. I did a conservation easement, which means we can't develop on it, but I get to write off the development rights. Another thing is I buy artwork. I donate the artwork to museums and I buy them in bulk so I can get a deep discount. And now I get back more money than I would I spend on it. That's tax arbitrage. So you want the bucket of the team, you want the bucket of the deductions, and you want the bucket of reclassification, which is active to passive, ordinary income to capital gains, tax-free, and tax arbitrage. I know this is a lot in a short period of time, but I'm just giving you the framework so that now you can proactively have a conversation with your tax team and think like an entrepreneur. When you're brainstorming, nothing's illegal. You're going to say the craziest things. They can say, 
there's no way you can write that off. I'm like, okay, fair, probably can't, but I thought I would just ask, right? But then you actually have them give you the tax law that supports your crazy ideas. And my main questions in that is I'll say, I want to write off these clothes I'm buying for this rap video I'm doing around money. They're like, well, you can't really write off clothes. I'm like, I know other rappers can, and I know I'm white and I probably can't rap, but that doesn't mean I couldn't have the same write-off. And they're like, well, if you have a production company, you can write it off. I'm like, great, we just figured out there's a way to write this off by asking different questions. Because they think in a box, we have to think outside of that box and then have them find ways to fit that. So the first thing was tax. The second thing is interest. We can lower interest rates in today's interest rate environment. The third thing is investments. There's a lot of hidden fees. You know, uh, There's a lot of non-performing fees. And Nicholas, if you earn... 10% on 100 grand over 30 years, it grows to 1.74 million. But if you only earn 9.2%, it grows to 1.4 million. That's $340,000 difference for less than a percent because of the compounding effect. So wow. when we think in terms of percentages, sometimes we miscalculate. When we think in the bottom line in actual numbers, we can have a more you know, like clear assessment of what it's costing us. And the fourth way to keep more of what we make is to structure your insurances properly. There's duplicate coverages, there's improper structure, low deductibles, not using umbrella policies, and people end up giving more money for less coverage because the first dollar we pay for any insurance is the most expensive, the last dollar is the cheapest. So my methodology on that or philosophy is insure the catastrophic, not the inconsequential. Inconsequential is you can write a check for it today and still go to sleep tonight. Catastrophic is it would put a kind of dent that would actually impact your mindset or you wouldn't have enough money to handle it. So let's transfer that risk. And when we look at those four things, then we can actually boost your bottom line without having to cut back. And so this is about keeping more of what you make. Now, the second way to become economically independent is we have to engineer wealth. Find what your monthly expenses are and reverse engineer and say, how do I create enough cash flow to cover that? Is it through this money savings I just talked about? Is it through cash flow investments? And then the third thing is, instead of accumulating for 30 years, focus on cash flow. Get assets that kick off cash flow rather than are going to pay off when you don't know whether it's going to work 30 years down the road. That's too long of a track. The fourth thing is scale your business revenue. What small tweaks can you make in your business that increase revenue? Is it hiring an employee? Is it adding automation? Is it creating a longer tell to your marketing? Is it having an upsell or downsell? Like you're looking at things that you could build that would actually create a much higher return than outside investments because you're a small business. And the fifth thing is to make it count. You are your greatest asset. Invest back into yourself, have more quality of life so that when you do show up to your business, you show up with the most energy and the best version of who you are. So plug financial leaks, by saving on you know, taxes, interest, insurance, and investments. Engineer wealth so you know what your cash flow needs to be. Accelerate your investment income by creating cash flow investments. Scale your business revenue by investing in the infrastructure of your business and the proper assets. And then fifth, invest back into yourself. This means stop funding retirement plans before you've properly funded your business. This means invest in your skill sets before you invest in companies you don't know anything about. This means discover who you are as an investor and stick to that instead of diversifying in things you know nothing about. So if you have to ask the question, Nicholas, should I invest in Bitcoin? The answer is no, because you're asking the question because it's not your investor DNA. Now, if crypto is your obsession and you have an understanding of it that's unparalleled, then maybe that's a good investment for you. Mm. But risk isn't in the investment, it's in who you are as the investor. So if you're not a good investor, you're speculating and gambling, which leads to losses. And those losses drive your mindset into scarcity, which starts to decimate your business income, which means you're in a vicious cycle of the garbage that we've heard for far too long, that high risk equals high return. What drunken Wall Street idiot came up with the concept of increasing your chance of losing to help you win? That doesn't work. Or what about this notion you're in it for the long haul? The long haul, you never hear that about anything good. That sounds like uh, you never want to hear that from your mechanic or you never want to hear that from your dentist. Why the hell do you want to hear that from your planner? You don't. Nicholas, the only people for the long haul are truckers. That's one long haul none of us want to make. It's all speed and hemorrhoids just pushing through to get to your destination. Shit, that sounds doesn't it? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> oh, the comments. Masters in Wealth in 20 Minutes. Garrett slamming the mic down now. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So I, one question that I'd love to ask, because what generally happened, I remember hearing you speak for the first time years and years and years ago. I was like, okay, uh, how do I get started? 
right? Um, now, obviously, people are in different places in the world or whatnot, but but what is that thought pattern of like, obviously, you need a team. I think you started with that whole concept, but clearly certain people are better than others at their job. And uh, what's the first step to either finding, interviewing? Do you have resources? What are the questions we ask? How, how do people start just moving in the right direction of ensuring that this element of their life is buttoned down properly and moving you know, towards where we need to go with it? Yeah, uh, wealthfactory.com forward slash private allows you to fill out some information because we have a comprehensive financial team. It's fully comprehensive in the US. It's quasi comprehensive in Canada. Right. I can't understand all the tax law in Canada. I, mean, I tried so many times, but uh, right. I guess maybe you need to be born there. I'm missing the gene. But you know, I do have a, a Canadian business partner, so I do say sorry more often. I am mm. saying process more often. So, and I've I've become a little bit more likable for some reason. So, uh, you know, that's all the good things from Canada. You could you could look there, but the, let me give you the really basics. Yeah. Like, go to your bank and set up a separate account. And it could be a checking, a money market, or savings. I don't want it to get a big rate of return because I just want it to be available and liquid. And I want you, every time you pay yourself from your business, take a percentage off the top and automatically save it into that account. You can have it sweep over to that account automatically with most banks. And I want you to build at least six months of personal savings there of what I would call a peace of mind fund. When we have enough liquidity, we can stay stronger with our with our things that might be a little bit longer term to pay off. Mm. We can, if we have a health issue or family issue or pandemic, we have a little bit more staying power that removes some of the scarcity when we're illiquid. It means we don't have to chase bad profits and take on the wrong clients just to make payroll. So I want you to just automatically start saving money. Unfortunately, the financial world has got people to automatically invest and neglect saving. People go, oh, I automatically save money. I'm like, where? They're like, oh, in my RRSP. I'm like, well, an RRSP is not liquid. It has restrictions. It's typically invested in the stock market, so it's volatile. I want you, even though it doesn't get a high rate of return, moving some money into a savings account so that you can think with more peace of mind. And by the way, even if it's getting a low rate of return, then you can change the deductibles on your insurance or the elimination period on your disability if you have it, which will lower your premiums because you have cash to handle the small stuff. And by handling the small stuff, you can save money in other places. So just get that automation to pay yourself first. And when you do, I actually want you to set up a second bank account called the Living Wealthy account. And if you start saving money and you're building up liquidity, I also want you to save money to spend however you enjoy most. What are the things that you really enjoy? Now, it's probably not going to buy the exotic cars that Nicholas has, but it might buy some accessories for it, right? It might put some gas in it for, for a few minutes. But that this living wealthy account I've used to have lay down seats when I fly to Europe to buy a, a jacket that's super expensive, but I thought was super cool and unique because it's guilt free spending because I know I'm doing the right things. I want to enjoy life along the way. So pay yourself first and set up side of fund that allows you to enjoy life so that you're not just trying to retire because you're working your tail off because you're never getting to take a vacation because you never get to spend it on the things you want because you're constantly trying to get more and do more. And if you'll just take care of yourself, you'll actually be able to produce more long term because you won't burn out. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.